The Resource Management Act and the way it's administered is a dog. Absolutely not. I think there's, there's, there's this hackneyed right-wing view that we have, which is it's a dog, it's anti-development, uh, let's, let's get rid of it. And it, and it gets kicked um, all the time. It's caught up in, in, in courts and lawyers and all sorts of systems that are very, very difficult for people to engage with. The Resource Management Act sets out how we should manage our environment. It's based on the principle of sustainable management and is intended to consider the effects of activities on the environment when resource management decisions are made. As well as managing air, soil, fresh water and coastal marine areas, the RMA regulates land use and the provision of infrastructure. Created in 1991, it replaced or amended 50 earlier laws, but has itself been amended 80 times in the last 20 years. The complexity of the RMA is perhaps best illustrated by the fact that the Ministry of the Environment has an optimistically named Everyday Guide to the RMA, which is in fact 15 separate guides or booklets. The original intention of the RMA, I think, really was to allow people to be more creative, to push the envelope a little bit and focus on effects-based outcomes. So the theory was very simply, uh, why shouldn't you be able to do something if it doesn't create a negative effect, uh, if it's hidden or, or whatever? You know, why can't you do that? Or if you can mitigate that effect in some way, whatever that might be. I might even be paying somebody money. But the idea was to open up for new opportunities. But in a sense, what it's become is a long-winded process. They've tried to sort out the appeals process and simplify that, that often doesn't allow progress or change. Sometimes that's for the right reasons, and sometimes it's an opportunity missed. So I do think we need to be a bit gutsier. Initial responsibility for looking after the environment under the RMA is devolved to 11 regional councils, 67 territorial authorities, mostly district councils, and six unitary authorities. These groups come up with regional and district plans which concentrate on particular parts of the environment and land. Central government can issue policy statements, and in theory, you as a member of the public can make a submission about your local district plan. The processes that we have to follow under the legislation make it very difficult for people to be fully aware and fully involved in big decision making on a day-to-day -day basis. And the district plan is a classic example as we have effectively four stages um, and um, of the district plan process. Each one of them takes months and months of hearings and thousands and thousands of pages of submissions and evidence and um, and even professional planners struggle to keep up to play with the um, the, the goings on so the the general public just don't have any opportunity to, to be involved in all levels with that and that's definitely one of the the challenges that's become impenetrable you like to the to the average person to be involved in I remember talk, dealing with the Auckland Council chief planners and working through the whole process and uh, it wasn't long before they told me they were all up and leaving and I said why are you leaving the council and they said because the RMA is coming in and we'll be needed as consultants. Well sort of said it all and from then on I've been proven right. <laughs> the top people are leaving to be consultants. It's a problem. The RMA, the consultants and the lawyers particularly come into play when people want to do something that the district plan doesn't allow. Every application for a resource consent must include an assessment of environmental effects and an assessment of relevant policy and plan provisions. That might not sound too hard, but under the RMA, the information that must be included in a resource consent application is extensive. 5% of the applications received by councils are notified, which means anybody can make a submission. According to the Ministry of the Environment's website, about 30,000 resource consents are processed throughout New Zealand each year. And about 300, or 1%, are appealed to the Environment Court, which is an expensive place to hang out.
When it came into force in 1991, you know, the big aim of it was to make an intervention into the piecemeal approach that was in our legislative framework for dealing with the environment, looking after the environment and building. And um, in lots of ways that has not been realised. It was world renowned when it was released and because it was envisaged as being a complete set of resource management tools, a lot of those tools haven't been implemented. The issues are that it's one act which is designed to adjudicate over everything from the smallest detail to the largest. So you can you can have a, a, a RMA request to to change uh, you know, a window in, in your house if you've got a listed house perhaps, um, or you've got a, an RMA request under the same act to build a hydro dam in the South Island involving moving half a mountain and, and diverting two rivers. And the same act is, is supposed to, to react fairly for both of these. And clearly it's stressed, clearly it's not quite designed right for those. It wasn't completed as it was foreseen when it was originally, how the way it was originally designed. If it had had more direction provided, so around freshwater, around um, urban design, and all of those things had been implemented earlier, I think it would have had a lot more of a chance. I've never seen the Resource Management Act as the problem um, because I think we already have a problem with building standards and that our building standards should be higher. But also the Resource Management Act is often whacked by people who think that Auckland should be sprawling more in particular and that the answer to our housing crisis is to open up more land at the city fringe, not just in Auckland but in other places, and build more suburbs there. I don't think that is the answer and I think that where the Resource Management Act has restrained that sort of development um, it's definitely been our friend. I think the RMA has been a game changer for Māori. Um, it, for the first time, has enabled Māori to be a player in uh, the, the control of environmental development. It's uh, not ideal, it, it does need some work, but uh, inherent within it is some, some very good uh, protections that, that Māori have been able to uh, finally used to, to protect the environment that we all, all want to enjoy. A lot of developers will say the RMA is too restrictive. Uh, I can't build things because the RMA doesn't let me. But I think that, uh, I think there's some truth in that, but also the RMA is there to give us these checks and balances to make sure that uh, we can we can do things adequately. I mean, it was a different beast once upon a time, and we have amended it, um, you know, till the cows come home. It's, it's, it doesn't look anything like it. It did originally. Now, one of the things I would change about New Zealand, if I could, is I, I would lengthen the electoral cycle. Because the problem is that we have a government that's elected, and they know that three years hence, they're going through the same process. So no government has really got time to undertake a fundamental review of legislation like the RMA. We've got two pieces of work. We've got some early steps being done through national policy statements, which are an instrument under the uh, Resource Management Act that tries to ease up on land supply. One of the problems, uh, if you've got a growing centre and you constrict it as to the geographic boundary around a town or a city, plus you have rules against intensification within the boundary, then you create an artificial scarcity of development uh, options which drives up the price of everything that's yet to be built and has already been built. Uh, so we're addressing that through revisions to the National Policy Statement on Urban Development. In addition to that, we've got a, a broader piece of review work that's being led by a retired Court of Appeal judge, the Honourable Tony Randerson QC, and he's due to report back in a couple of months. Um, and that's a more root and branch review of the RMA to make sure that we get good urban form, but nonetheless that we have functioning land uh, markets so that people can have affordable places to live. As well as that piece of work by Judge Tony Randerson, which will likely arrive sometime around the election, perhaps confirming the opinion that it's difficult to make RMA changes in a three-year election cycle. There's a temporary change being made with the justification of kick-starting the economy post-COVID-19. For the next two years, selected projects can bypass the RMA process and be considered by an expert consulting panel. There will be fast decisions, no individual public consultation and limited appeal rights. 
It's understood that if a project is selected by the Minister of the Environment and referred to the panel, then there's a high level of certainty the resource consent will be granted. And then maybe, just maybe, the RMA might be reformed in the next electoral cycle. This programme was made possible by the RNZ NZ On Air Innovation Fund.